Well, folks, you've been hanging in a long time today, and congratulations to you. I hope you, <laughs> I hope you <clears throat> feel strengthened and emboldened by all of the things that you've heard today. I certainly have, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I'm really glad to hear that the uh, that you're really thinking about next year and planning for next year and the year after, because this whole idea of getting together as a community to celebrate water, the thing that we take so much for granted in this part of the world, yet we're moving into a century where the wars of the 21st century are more and more likely to be fought over water, that water itself <coughs> has become very much the center point of a lot of struggles that are going on. And it's very much linked to global warming and it's very much linked to a variety of other environmental issues. So what you can do here in Elm Elmvale and in the surrounding region to lift up that importance is extremely important. And therefore, I really want to join many of the other speakers in congratulating the committee that has put this on in such short time and hope that with the leadership of Bill uh, Shadik and other people that we'll see more of this happen and more of this grow and develop here in the community. And it will be a benefit to us all. No question about it. Like Colin before me, <laughs> I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. Not that I'm against PowerPoint presentations, it's just that when I got word that uh, this is what was required or requested, I should say, I was in the midst of a holiday and I said, to hell with it, I'm not going back to put together a PowerPoint presentation. Besides, at this stage of the game, probably just talking and interacting with you is the, the best way to go anyway for the moment. I also want to say that I am not a water scientist or a scientist. I am what you might call a water activist, but more of a sort of socio-political activist and have been for many years now, or an environment political activist. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, I want to say that we, in the Polaris Institute, do a lot of our work on water issues. And we have worked on the privatization of water services, worked on issues like the export, bulk export of water from Canada to the United States, those kinds of issues, critiquing, <coughs> critiquing that. And we have worked very much on the topic that I will be speaking about today, namely bottled water. But in the process of doing that, I want to share with you a little bit of our experiences in trying to reach out to the broader public, of working with citizens and working with communities, of trying to help communities take control over some understanding of what is happening to their watersheds and their water sources. What is going on here in Elmdale with the fight against Dump 41 and all of that is very much a part of a pattern of struggles that are going on around this country and increasingly around the world itself. And I'll come back to that a little bit later in my presentation. But our work in the Polaris Institute is to try to take some of that scientific analysis and understanding and translate it into a program of education and action whereby citizens rise up and take control of that which is most precious in our lives, namely water itself. But I want to start just for a few moments by saying that, that water itself, in our understanding of things, is very much a very important, precious resource. It is a precious element of our life itself. And when we have said several times in the course of the day, and I think we all acknowledge it, there is no life on this planet without water. Neither plants, nor animals, nor human beings. And so what we do with our water sources is going to be absolutely crucial in the future, in the present and in the future. And I think we need to take into consideration here the 
fact that we are not simply dealing with a commodity. In fact, I would say that's one of the problems we're experiencing today, the effort to commodify water, to put a price on it, as if that was the only answer. Yes, we need to value water a great deal more, that's for sure. But we also need to guard against the commodification, commercialization, and privatization of water itself. We in the, what we call the water justice movement in the world today, consider water to be very much a part of the commons itself. Every human being, every plant, every animal deserves to have access to water itself. So therefore, to try to say that water can be privatized, that there can be private ownership over water itself, and therefore control in private hands for, for a for-profit purpose, that runs contrary to the main, making sure that water itself is available to all forms of life on this planet. So essentially we say water belongs first and foremost to the earth itself and to the planet. And that is a cardinal principle, if you will, in our way of working on water issues. Now I want to say just a few words about work with water scientists. I have found in my work as a water activist that dialogue with water scientists, dialogue with science in general, but water scientists in particular, is extremely important to the work that we do. Let me give a couple of examples. A few years ago, I was in Europe, spending time primarily in Switzerland, but in Germany and a number of other countries. And the purpose of the trip was really to engage in dialogue with water scientists and what they were discovering about water. And I found, for example, a group of scientists that were working on looking at trees and water in trees. And they discovered, for example, that there was a direct connection between water in trees and the lunar cycles, the cycles of the moon. And they found that through the cycles of the moon and looking and observing the lunar cycles, that water contracted or expanded in response to different lunar cycles. Now, you may say, well, that's interesting, but what has that got to do with us? <laughs> and Afterwards, there was, after hearing about this and interacting and dialoguing with these water scientists about these lunar cycles and their impact upon water and trees, we began to discuss, well, what about human beings? If, and if it is true, and uh, you know, it's clearly true that 55, between 55 and 80% of our human bodies, depending on what age we are, is composed of water. So if 55 to 80 percent of our human bodies are composed of water, might there be some kind of correlation similar as we see in trees, contracting and expanding our water content in response to the lunar cycles? Again, these scientists weren't prepared to say yes to that, but the discussion and dialogue continued into that realm. So there is an important role, I think, that can be uh, an important piece of work that can be carried out between water activists and water scientists in making that connection and those discoveries. A second example would be meeting with scientists who have been examining water crystals and finding that when you freeze water and water crystals form, that those water crystals will often, the pattern will differ and change. And so they put together a number of tests with uh, looking at water crystals and freezing water as it passes through different plant life and seeing the different formations change on the water crystals in response to the different plant life or seeing water flowing uh, through in response to different colors of plants 
or also water itself uh, when you freeze it and the crystals, uh, you examine the crystals in response to uh, music and different kinds of music. And in all of the cases, the patterns of the crystals changed. And again, there's no clear explanation about this except that it raises a whole discussion about taking the molecular character of water a few steps further and trying to understand what is really going on here. Is there something more about the molecular makeup of water and the molecular character of water that we need to discover? And again, these are questions. There are no clear answers to this, but they are questions to be probed in the future and through further experimentation and testing. During that same trip to Europe and meeting with those water scientists, I got a call in the last few hours before I was about to leave, and it was from a Dr. Joan Davis, who is considered to be the dean of uh, water scientists in, in, uh, in Switzerland, or has been in the past, and she said, I want to meet you. And I said, well, I've, I'm leaving tomorrow morning. And she said, well, get on a train and come right away to Zurich. I'll meet you at the train station. <laughs> well, great thing about Europe, as you know, and Switzerland in particular, you can get on a train and actually go from city to city very quickly. And so I did. And uh, went to the, met her in the train station. And here she is, I guess, in her early 70s. and. Uh, her gray hair and her little glasses, and we sat down to talk, and I was full of questions as a result of all of the work there, all of the discussions I'd had in the course of the previous uh, couple of weeks. And she said, no, no, she says, I, I don't want you, we only got a short bit of time here, I want to talk with you about bottled water. And I said, but I have all these questions I want to talk to you about. And she says, later. She says, now I want to just talk to you about bottled water and ask you some questions. And I said, OK. So she proceeded to talk about how important it is for water to move and to flow uninterrupted in the sense that once you start to dam water and trap it, then you create problems with water. And the reason that she was giving is that water purifies itself as it moves. And it's through the circulation and the movement of water that water actually purifies itself. So then she said, the problem with bottled water, of course, is that we trap water in a very small container. And we keep it trapped in that container, and we transport it over long distances to get from point A to point B to market it. And in the meantime, it could stay on shelves or in storage depots for heaven knows how long. And the more that water is not moving, the more it, the potential for contamination takes place. And she'd been saying that one of the things that she was studying at that time and the research that she is doing is with pregnant women. Pregnant women who have, have uh, taken bottled water during prior to their pregnancy and during their pregnancy have been drinking bottled water and have been showing signs of cancer. And she had been conducting a number of studies and tests on this. None of, none of which was conclusive at that time, none of which I don't think at this moment is very conclusive because her studies are still continuing. The point I'm making here is that she was making a connection uh, between these symptoms of cancer in pregnant women, potentially, and the problem of bottled water and water being trapped in, in, uh, and unable to purify itself because it can no longer move and circulate. And that brings me to the whole question of what are we talking about when we talk about bottled water itself. And I say this because a lot of this does come out of dialogue with scientists, but then again, we must take it further in terms of discussion and creation of opportunities for discussion and debate in communities. Because we are talking today, now, uh, about a phenomenon that has become explosive 
in the world today as far as the water industry is concerned. This is the fastest growing part of the entire water industry is bottled water. And why we're dealing with bottled water in that sense is that if you look back 25 years ago, if you saw bottled water being sold, it would be sold, undoubtedly it was sold in glass bottles. And the companies that were selling it to you were local companies or companies and, and independent companies. Local and independent companies that somehow took the water from the local area, bottled a bit of it and sold a bit of it for convenience purposes. Now, what's happened is that in the last 15 years, we have seen a massive change take place with regards to the production and sale of bottled water. No longer small independent companies. Now we have four major global corporations that control the production and sale of bottled water in the world. You take a company like Nestle's, which was the first one to really enter the, the, uh, the market at big time, and Nestle's started looking around, realizing that bottled water had a future, and so they bought up Perrier. Perrier was the European brand of bottled water sold in glass bottles, shipped over in somewhat of a market open up here in North America. But when Nestle's took it over, they took it over with a view of saying they were going to open up a huge market in North America and elsewhere in the world for the sale of Perrier. And they started it and they started marketing Perrier and they built, they developed a very special kind of strategy for marketing uh, bottled water and, and, and particularly Perrier in North America. And they ended up having a major response. They then went on to buy up 75 other independent companies, bottled water companies, around the world. They now have operations all over the world in all continents, but their prime markets are still Europe and North America, but they're opening up very much in Latin America and in Asia. And uh, the result is we're seeing a major globalization of the, glo of the bottled water market. Then in the 1990s, uh, later on in the 1990s, uh, uh, around 1994, 95, Pepsi Cola decided that it was going to get into the market and it would start to promote its own brand and it came out with the Aquafina brand. And Aquafina is now, has, continues to be their flagship, their main uh, bottled water product. And Coca-Cola entered into the market in 1997-1998 with their Dasani brand of uh, bottled water. The entrance of these two uh, soft drink giants into the bottled water market was a response to a recognition that the obesity issue with regards to soft drinks was getting very much out of hand, that they were no longer able to control it and that they wanted to have a product that would start to replace their main line, uh, uh, their main line soft drinks. And so they brought the bottled water brands up on the, on the screen and moved them forward and ended up promoting both Aquafina and Dasani. In the meantime, the third largest food conglomerate uh, coming out of Europe, which is Danone, uh, decided that it would buy up Evian, which was a big water, bottle of water company in France, and then bought up uh, something like 26 uh, other brands, and it formed a, a conglomerate with regards to the sale of bottled water. So in the end, you have four major companies. From Europe, you have uh, Nestle's, the largest food uh, corporation in the entire world. Danone, which is uh, ranked number three in terms of food products. 
And then on top of that, the two soft drink giants, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. And to, between the four of them, they now control the world's water, bottled water industry. So what are we dealing with here? What is really the problem with bottling of water, besides trapping the essence of life, as uh, my friend Joan Davis uh, said? Well, first of all, there's the question about where this water comes from. If you're buying a product from Nestle's or uh, Danone, then the product is most likely, here in North America, it most likely comes from a rural spring somewhere. So it's like the company coming into Elmvale or into spring water and, and buying up access to the, to the pure, pristine water there and taking the water out and then going through their processes uh, of distillation and then putting it in bottles and selling it. Nestle's and Danone, that's the process that they use here in North America. In the case of Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, they get their water from our public tap water system. It's the same water. They take this Dasani bottle, it's made up of water out of some tap system somewhere, <laughs> we don't know where for sure, uh, and they have bottled it and uh, gone through their pro processes of making it taste a little bit better and they put it in this bottle and they're, they're selling it. So the whole question of where they get their water from and also what they pay for that water is a big issue because they pay next to nothing for it. In the case of Nestle's or Danone with their rural springs, all they pay for is a license a 10-year license to extract the water. That license can cost $1,500, $2,000, $2,500, something like that. And they, they're able to extract, say, up to 50,000 liters a day or something like that, and on and on it goes. So the problem is you, they pay next to nothing for it, and they get access to a rural spring to be able to take that water. Secondly, with regards to the, um, to the, uh, to the, to the uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola that take their water from the public tap system, nobody knows what public tap systems they're taking it from. The source is not indicated at all. Now, I know Aquafina or, or Pepsi-Cola has come out and said in the last few days that it will start to label, put on the label where it gets its water from, but up until this time, nobody has known where the water exactly comes from. The second issue has to do with what they try to do with this water. Now, you know, if you take down a forest, <laughs> you usually turn that, that wood into some product and then you sell that product. You transform it into a product. You transform the uh, crude petroleum you take out of, the, out of the ground, you transform it into various forms of gasoline and oil for sale, etc. There's a transformation process that really goes on. What we're led to believe by the bottled water companies is that they are able to transform water into water. Now this is quite a miracle. This is quite a miracle. Maybe they should go Shrine of the Martyrs and learn more about how to bring the spiritual religious presence for this miracle to take place. But this is what they claim to do. But really, in the case of Coca-Cola, just taking that as an example, they put it through a distillation process, what they call a process of osmosis, and they, they, they put it through that process, and in that they add certain minerals to improve the taste of it, but then they turn around and sell it to us for thousands of times more than what it would cost to take out of the tap system, which we'll come to in a minute. The point is that they are claiming to transform water into water. Something like the snakes, snake oil salesman of the opening up of the West or something. Anyway, the third issue is really has to do with what some of us have been talking, some people have been talking about today, and that's the bacteriological and and, and more specifically, the chemical contents. And the question is, how much 
bacteriological and chemical uh, chemicals are uh, contaminants are actually in bottled water. Well, you know, we really don't know much about that. There have been very few independent studies that have been conducted. There was a study conducted uh, a number of years ago, two studies conducted by Health Canada a number of years ago. There was a study conducted by the University of Tuskegee, and more recently a, a team of scientists in the Netherlands did a study as well. And in each of the case, they came out that they would study maybe 25 brands up to 50, 60 brands, or in the case of what you heard from Bill Schottick earlier today, 130 brands were, uh, were tested. And, and in the process, looking for different chemicals and trying to find out what's in, and traces of unacceptable levels of mercury, of arsenic, of bro, uh, bromate, of, um, of E. coli, were found in many of these studies. But the problem is there is no ongoing process of independent studies being conducted on the, chemi on the con chemical or bacteriological contamination that may be in bottled water. So it poses a real problem. They call it pure, healthy, and safe. It's written all over their labels. But there are very few independent studies to confirm one way or the other whether that's the case or not. Furthermore, this is tested much more irregularly than tap water is. Tap water in most public water systems here in Ontario can go through four, five, six different tests a day. In the case of, uh, of uh, bottled water, there is no system for regularly testing the, 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 the contents of bottled water. And the companies themselves do it voluntarily. The information that they get from their tests is kept confidential. You and I cannot have access to that information. And when you talk to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is the part branch of the federal government that's responsible for bottled water, because this is a food product, therefore comes under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, when you talk to them, you find out, you ask them how often do they inspect the plants and procedures of the bottled water companies, and they say, we're lucky if we do it three times, uh, sorry, we're lucky if we do it once every three years, and in the, next, in the future, we're likely to do it once every four years or more, simply because of the cutbacks that have ex existed in their department and in the government. So these are problems. And then we move on to the fourth issue, which uh, is one that has been discussed quite a bit here today, and I won't go into it in great detail, and that is what the container that this water is put in, the plastic. Now we have to keep in mind that plastic is really made up of both fossil fuels and uh, toxic chemicals. That's what plastic is made of. So you package water within this kind of, these kind of containers, and the result is bound to have extraordinary environmental impacts. Whether it's thrown away and it ends up in a landfill somewhere, whether it's left exposed openly to, to the sun and to CO2 emit, potential CO2 emissions into the air, or whether uh, we're just talking about the leaching that we heard about earlier today with regards to antimony leaching from uh, the plastic into the water itself. There is a great deal we need to know more about regarding the plastic impact of water on, on the water itself. On top of that, very few of these bottles are recycled. The, this particular plastic made of polyethylene uh, is, uh, is a plastic that the PET bottles, only 10% in Canada of the PET bottles that are sold are actually recycled. And when you add on top of that the fact that the companies that produce these bottled water products, like, this, like Pepsi and Coca-Cola, for example, have only committed themselves to, two, to recycling 2.5% 2 .2 of the plastic 
that they use. In other words, the plastic, only 2.5% of the plastic they used is actually recycled plastic. So there's no commitment to recycling in relationship to the bottled water industry. Fifthly, we move on to the marketing, the mass marketing, which has been this created this incredible explosion of consumption with regards to bottled water. You know, today in Canada, one fifth of the entire population depends upon bottled water exclusively for their drinking and their hydration. One fifth. 25 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, you would probably hardly count anybody that was, that was depending on bottled water uh, for, their, for their drinking water. But that is the situation that we're faced with today. This is the result of mass marketing. This is the result of hundreds of millions of dollars from the industry being t uh, used for selling people on the so-called merits of bottled water. And all of those things, all of that marketing and advertising has been at least subtly and indirectly aimed at undercutting the public water system or the tap water system in general. The idea is to say that your tap water is, I mean, obliquely, <laughs> indirectly, subtly, say that your tap water is really not safe and that the only real safe, healthy, and pure water is to be found in, in these bottles and bottled water. And that's the orientation of the industry and that's been the orientation of their marketing. On top of that, they're able to corner the market in certain areas and, and create captive markets. In schools, for example, in all of your, most of your schools, I think, uh, you will find that the companies have struck uh, deals, contracts uh, with the school boards for the sale of, uh, of their, of their uh, juices and their bottled water products. And that is certainly the case with regards to Coca-Cola and Pepsi as they've hopscotched all across this province and across the country and across the, uh, North America in general in capturing uh, these markets through exclusivity contracts, which means that if Pepsi-Cola has a, a contract in a particular school district, only Pepsi-Cola products get sold in that school district. The same thing with Coca-Cola or the others as well. So we're, they're into, and we are into, monopoly market control through these exclusivity markets and exclusivity contracts. And the sixth and final uh, point regarding the whole question of bottled water itself has to do with the prices. And we're dealing with <clears throat> something like this, a three, uh, just a little over uh, half a liter of, of, uh, of water, costs something like $1.45, which is what I paid for this on my way here, $1.45. You turn around, and what you're dealing with constantly is the fact that this water, we are paying for this amount of water thousands of times more than we would pay for the same amount of water out of the tap system. If I were to take the same amount of water as I have in my hand here, out of the Montreal tap system, it would cost one five hundredth of a cent. Compare that with a dollar forty-five. That's the kind of price gouging and markup that we're that we're dealing with with regards to bottled water. So there are some very real and basic issues to be dealt with regarding this product, the bottled water. Now I want to conclude by just referring to the fact that around the world and in this country and in this province, there are considerable struggles taking place in communities protecting their and defending their own local water sources over and against these big bottled water companies. I won't by any means go into them all at, at all. But I mean, right here in Ontario alone, there have been major battles fought in Aurora, in uh, Grafton, in um, um, Guelph, and a number of other communities where people have been fighting 
uh, against these companies coming in and taking their rural spring and their rural water and transforming, or transforming it into bottled water sales. At the same time, at the same time that this has been going on, around the world, major, major battles have been waged and are being waged as we speak at the, this very moment. One brief example would be in a little place in the southern part of India, in a little village called Plachimata, which is located in the state of Kerala. It's a village of roughly 5,000 people. And Coca-Cola came in with a state-of-the-art uh, 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 plant uh, and set up a bottled water plant. And it started taking water out of the local water sources and the local aquifers. The farmers started to complain about this because they were, their water sources were drying up. And furthermore, their water sources were being contaminated with lead and with cadmium that was the part of the byproduct of the Coca-Cola plant itself, producing other products. And the result was that, that women started to organize and say, we've got to shut the plant down. We've got to stop this plant from doing what it's doing. And so they organized a major massive sit-in. And each day they conducted a 24-hour vigil. And I was there in January of 2005, and that was the 1,000th day of their protest. And they had managed to get the local government to go side by side with them to call on the company that had to stop their operations. And so the company legally, Coca-Cola, was told to stop their operations. Coca-Cola then appealed that decision to the High Court of India in the state of Kerala. And in the High Court, they ruled eventually that the, the, the local government was right and they upheld the decision of the local government. And then on top of that, Coca-Cola took the next step of taking the issue to the Supreme Court of India and called on the Supreme Court to overthrow the decision. That battle is still going on legally as we speak at this very moment. But at the same time, what happened as a result of that was a whole nation was awakened at, to the problems of, of these companies and what they are doing to the water systems. When I was there in January 2005, we learned that there were 26 cities and towns across India that were going to engage two weeks later in a massive protest against Coca-Cola and Pepsi for their water takings. And they organized this in community after community all the way through, all, all over India, wherever there were major plants. And in one area alone, one city and town alone, 10,000 people linked arms around the entire plant area and the water source area where the people, uh, where, where the water was being taken. And they protested against both the water takings and the contamination of local water systems. So this is a part of an ongoing global struggle. If we had the time, I can see the signal here, the time is running out. If we had the time, we could go on and tell many more stories like this. But I just want to leave that with you, to leave you with the impression that Whatever you take up here in, in Elmville, the, the continuation of this water festival, the struggle and the battle against Dump 41, the Dump 41 site, that you are part of a larger global set of struggles that are going on where citizens and communities are organizing and rising up and saying, this is our water, keep your hands off it and it will serve local purposes, and we will decide what to do with our water. Thank you very much.